Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Tar Heel Illustrated.com, or if you're watching on our YouTube channel, Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner, and joining me, as he always does, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And Andrew, we're here for part one of our two part fall look ahead football series. Obviously, had the spring game on Saturday. Got a lot of good stuff from that, and we've obviously been covering the team throughout spring practice and whatnot as well. So kind of a lot of things to discuss with the offense, which we'll dive into in just a second. But before we do that, make sure you guys head on over to TarHillIllustrated.com after this video is done and sign up for our premium subscription, just $8.33 a month. It's a great time to do it in the offseason as well. There's going to be a ton of football and basketball recruiting stuff, especially that we're going to be putting in there, 99% of what our very own basketball recruiting analyst and David Sis does is on the boards. And it's kind of the same for Dina King as well, who's our football recruiting expert. So if you want those tidbits and kind of what's going on behind the scenes and recruiting, go ahead, go ahead. And after this video is done, of course, head on over to our site and sign up for just eight 33 a month, AJ, but that's enough of the plugs on my end, man. Let's dive into the offense right here. Saw the offense on, you saw the offense on Saturday. We've seen them throughout the spring as well. Um, we're going to kind of dive into some depth chart stuff potentially and, and some other stuff with the position groups. But before we dive into that, AJ, what are kind of your overall thoughts from watching the uh, offense this spring and kind of what you saw in the spring game? Well, I think they're going to be fine. Yeah. Safe to and say that. People, yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are panicking about, well, no Michael Carter, no Javante Williams, no Deami Brown, no Daz, uh, Daz mm-hmm. Newsom. Don't think about what they don't have. It's time that Carolina fans and people who cover the team and people who follow the team in various different capacities start viewing the team based on what they do have and what they will have in the fall. And we're going to go over the position groups here in a couple of minutes, but I think as a whole, the offense is going to be fine. When you have a, a extremely strong foundation at the offensive line and you have perhaps the leading candidate for the Heisman Trophy behind center, that's a pretty damn good place to start. Yeah. And they and we talked about bells and whistles in the video after the spring game when we were down on the field. They got bells and whistles, guys. Now, some of them may be in the package. You may have to kind of open up the package and pull them out and, and you know, get them, pull the sticker off and hang them up and that kind of thing. But the bells and whistles, the ornaments to the tree are there. Now you're just going to have to get used to having a couple of different ones, maybe some different lights or stencil, whatever it is people use in the Christmas tree. I'm following up with the Christmas tree. Now, uh, yeah, I love that one example I gave on, on, on Saturday. Mm-hmm. So it's all there. All the pieces are there. The depth is there, I believe, for this to be a really, really good offense. Now, there might be some parts of the offense that end up a little bit better than we anticipate right now. There might be one or two parts that maybe aren't as strong as we anticipate they will be. But I think as a whole, when this team is in mid-October, you're going to see them operating at a high level every week. And that's good because the toughest part of their schedule is in the back half of the season. When they have mm-hmm. to go to Notre Dame, they go to Pitt, they go to NC State to close up the season. And Miami, I believe, is game number seven at home. So that those games, that part of the schedule is going to determine what this team is. So the, the, the lesser experienced groups that they currently have – We'll have plenty of time to get up to snuff by mid-October. I think they'll be ready to roll once they get through the FSU game. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying there, AJ. You talked about diving into some of the specific uh, position groups, so let's go ahead and do that. Not going to – I think we already know the answer to quarterback, so we'll skip that one. I think everybody can agree that Sam Sam Howell's your starting guy going in. But backup position, though. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, an interesting one because from what we saw in the spring game and throughout the spring – I thought Criswell and May both kind of showed flashes um, of what they can be. I think Criswell, from what I've seen in the open practice, the three that we went to especially, he impressed me a little bit more, which you'd probably expect from a guy who's been in the program, Drake May obviously coming in fresh. And you got Jefferson Boaz as well, who was pretty clear from the spring game is kind of the fourth guy based on when he played in that game. But I think it's, it's, it's a good problem to have. But for me going into the season, if I had to pick one who I think the backup is right now, I, I would probably lean a little bit toward, more towards Criswell based on what I saw. Yeah, and people need to understand that Mac has repeatedly said that the true competition for the backup spot wasn't going to begin until after spring practice. Right now, we're going to mm-hmm. go through meetings. Uh, there's There might be some movement 
for, from offensive players that might decide to go somewhere else. And the portal's crazy. Carolina hasn't really lost many guys to it. And, and they might lose a few more because Mac's going to have to have hard conversations with guys about this is what you're going to play next year, how much you're going to play. So if you want to go somewhere else, well, if you find a place, if you want to stay, fantastic. We want you in the program. That's not going to happen at quarterback. At quarterback, when the players return, you know, at some time in, in late May, the, and they begin player-led practices, that is when Criswell and May are going to begin their competition for who's going to win the backup job. It's going to carry over into fall camp. It starts in early August. And at some point in mid-August, I think the staff will make a decision. And right now, I don't think they know who they're going to, who, who is going to win that battle. Because of what you said, Criswell is ahead because he's been around. He's also really talented. You know, everyone thinks that May is the heir apparent. Chris Will was a four-star kid that a lot of programs wanted, big-time programs wanted. He's got a nice arm. Just a week ago, after the third practice that we saw in the second scrimmage, you were talking about, I think you may have asked somebody about some similarities and yeah. mannerisms and, and throws with Sam Howe, and there are those similarities. Uh, mm -hmm. He could also move. We saw yesterday or Saturday – in the spring game that he got to the second level of defense pretty quickly when he turned, when he, when he tucked it and ran. So Criswell is a formidable option as a backup with Drake may. I think what we saw Saturday that we didn't see in the three open practices we attended. And a lot of that was because it was so instructional that we didn't really get to see him just kind of do his thing. It was yeah. more Drake relying on his instincts, his natural gifts, and sort of throwing everything he had learned in 14 previous practices, putting it all together and, and seeing what was there. There's an upside there. Okay. Maybe a little more upside down the road than Criswell. And, and the thing that impressed me were the instincts. The, the time where he, he felt the rush coming from his right side, he was going to get sat. Like a kid mm -hmm. in his 15th college practice had the sense to step into a throw. He made a beautiful throw, well, an almost beautiful throw to Justin Olsen, who was just out of bounds when he caught him. He would have thrown the inside shoulder, probably would have made, probably would have been a fair catch, and they would have moved the ball 30 yards downfield. But the thing I loved about that play was how Drake sensed it, stepped into it, made the throw. He was even a little off balance when he threw it. He also had some really nice check downs, and he tucked and ran another time where he was sensing some things. So we saw instincts from him. So those guys are going to battle all summer. They're going to battle going into fall camp in August. And I, I think either one of them ultimately would be a really good option. As you said, this is a really good problem to have. Mm -hmm. You know, Ultimately, you could close your eyes and have them shuffle around and just kind of point at one of them, and you're yeah. going to be okay with that guy as your yeah, back. Yeah, I would agree, yeah. So what we're saying right now is unless someone bolts at the end, like Criswell leaves at the end of August, which we don't anticipate happening, no. they're going to be really, really strong at the second and third QB spots. And Jefferson Boas is very talented. He was a phenomenal high school athlete. There are, there are some teams in the ACC that would love to have him, and he'd mm -hmm. be competing for that job. But that room is so stacked that, you know, he's the fourth guy. But I bet you there are very few quarterbacks in any program in America, quarterback rooms, whose fourth guy is as capable, talented, and gifted as Jefferson Boaz. So that room is in really good shape. Yeah, I would agree. I think if you combined Boaz, Criswell, and, and May, too, you'd have a pretty dang good quarterback as well. Imagine, you know, Criswell and, and Jefferson Boaz's body with his athleticism and whatnot, you know. So I think, yeah, it, like I said, like a good Drake, problem to have. Drake can move. And Drake can oh, move. yeah, he can. Drake can run. Mm -hmm. He showed us in some of the scrimmages, and he showed us again Saturday. You know, he's got a long stride, so it's a little deceptive, but he could turn the corner and move. Yeah. Faster than you know, I thought he was, to be fair. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that's going to be most interesting about Drake when we see him in, in August is how much weight does he put on this offseason? Yeah, he and definitely needs to put on some. Mm -hmm. Got to put on a little bit of weight. But, you know, he could put on 12 to 15 in the next four months, next three months. Mm -hmm. when ball mm -hmm. camp starts three months in a week, I guess it is. And he could put that weight on and do it while it, how, in a way it doesn't affect his performance, affect his, his quickness and his speed and all that stuff. So that'll be interesting to see. Yeah, definitely. But I think overall, you got Sam Howell starting out there, a Heisman candidate, and you got three guys behind there that I think it could all play somewhere in the ACC and it, it play it at a high level anywhere in the country, a couple of them. So, yeah, really good uh, quarterback room right there, and it'll be interesting to see how that backup kind of role shakes out in, in fall camp. But let's talk about the running backs next, AJ. Um, Ty Chandler, obviously, coming in from Tennessee. We finally saw some glimpses of him yesterday. It didn't play a, a ton 
but we did see kind of the potential and not the potential, but what he can do and what he's proven he can do in his four previous seasons at Tennessee in terms of quickness, ability to block out of the backfield, ability to catch passes out of the backfield as well. So I think, you know, with him there, not only with his talent, but with his experience, extremely valuable to that room. And I think the second and third guy potentially from what we saw yesterday is probably DJ Jones and Caleb Hood. Now, obviously, there's a lot of other options. You got Elijah Green in there, British Brooks in there. Josh Henderson sowed flashes, particularly early on in that game. I think he had like 33 yards on one drive in particular. Um, all through him, ended up scoring as well. So he showed some glimpses and a former f- four-star uh, recruit out of high school. So he's definitely a talented guy. But from what I saw in the spring game, DJ Jones showed flashes of his quickness, showed flashes of why he's been talked about a lot during the spring, not only from players, but from, from Mac Brown as well. And then Caleb Hood was a guy that he, he's really impressed me since I first saw him, what, six or seven months ago um, at a VTO camp in Raleigh and kind of shot an ISO on him, which you can find on our YouTube channel. Was really impressed when I saw him then and had some moments during spring where he showed glimpses as well, but also had a lot of coaching moments during those open practices, which like we've talked about in a lot of the podcasts that we've done, you're going to kind of expect when you've got a, a guy that's in his third, fourth, fifth practice ever as a college player. So oh, wow. yeah, I know exactly. So overall, I, those three guys are the ones that I think from what I've seen in the spring, and this could obviously change going into fall camp. Those seem like the three guys that, have the best chance of kind of making up that rotation. Would you Would you kind of agree with that, or do you see it maybe going another way? I would, but I thought it was interesting when Mac was asked after the spring game about finding that three, and he said that, well, every time he thinks that they probably know, he knows who the three is going to be, someone else would have a great practice and enter into the <laughs> Yeah, I think that someone else on Saturday was once again Josh Henderson. Now, we've yeah. seen the Tar Heels, we saw him four times in spring. Twice, Henderson looked like a four-star guy. The other mm-hmm. two times, I, I'm not going to say he didn't look like a four-star guy. He just didn't stand out. Yeah. But the second practice we saw, which was the first scrimmage, he turned the corner and darted into the end zone. He showed some explosiveness, some speed, and, and just the ability to cut the corner quickly. It turned that nose upfield on a, on, a, on a dime, and mm-hmm. that gives you an edge, a split-second edge over defenders in pursuit. Like sometimes the difference is four or five yards on that run. He mm-hmm. did it again Saturday. In fact, that that drive that you alluded to, he had three totally different types of runs. And, and on the touchdown run, he bounced. Now, we've seen him do a lot of different things in, in spring camp, you know, in the way that he's going to run, a little bit more powerful. We hadn't seen the bounce, but we saw the bounce there. That's an instinctive thing. That's an athletic thing. That's being able to change and cut on a, on a dime. And he did that and got into the end zone. So I think he, you know, if – I think he's going to have something to say about this if he's still around. We don't know what those conversations are going to be like, and I'm not saying yeah. that they're going to say, well, Josh may go. He just may say, you know what, maybe I want to go somewhere I can be the guy right away and not have to fight against these other three because I do think the other three are clearly in the equation there. So we'll have to wait and see what happens there. But I do think that that is a, a deeper room that a lot of people realize, and I do think that they could achieve something fairly similar to what they got last year, just get it from more guys. Mm-hmm. utilizing a variety of strengths, which those guys have. Uh, yeah. and Caleb Hood, who you mentioned, who played quarterback in high school. Uh, mm-hmm. The thing that we saw from him yesterday that we mm-hmm. saw glimpses of in the earlier practices that we attended was we saw some speed. Oh, yeah. We saw him get through the hole and then get faster. And usually when you associate a 232-pound running back who's like 5'11 or something like that, you don't usually associate that kind of speed with him right away because you're anticipating all the physicality. And he was physical yesterday. Mm-hmm. There was a play Dina mentioned it on our message board today. In fact, someone was talking about Geo Biggers and Biggers and Hood had a collision that was impressive. And they both kind of won. But the freshman mm-hmm. got enough yardage to get the first down on the play. So we're going to mm-hmm. see him use that way. And of course, DJ Jones, he's shown us an ability to cut. He's shown us, an, he's shown us great vision. He senses things really well, and he showed us – he didn't have a great spring game, but he showed us a physicality. That means that I think he's a guy that can run inside, he can run outside, you can use him on on every down. I I think he can be a pretty decent receiver for him. He's a really good athlete. So I'm really anxious of all the guys on offense, and I'm kind of really looking forward to see get a bunch of game reps this fall to really see what they're about. It's probably DJ Jones because there's a high end there that I think – 
I think is, is well above what we've seen so far, but I don't really know where that is. And I don't know if the staff knows exactly where that is. Mm -hmm. And to find out, you got to throw them out on the field and let them play. Yeah. And then Chandler, Chandler's have been there, done that guy. I watched him specifically for one snap Saturday. Okay. And it happened to be a passing down and he, and he picked up the rush and he did a really good job in pass protection. And that's one of the reasons that's, one of the main reasons he's going to be the starting back and he's going to play a lot because he can do all that stuff because he's already been doing it for a few years and he's been doing it pretty well. Yeah. I thought some of Max quotes about him yesterday were kind of telling and he's talked about, you know, Ty a lot more recently in respect to him just being a, you know, a really good teammate and a leader and kind of how he's fit into the room and kind of how much he continues to impress him. So Max, Max definitely a guy that's talking Chandler up as well. And, um, I, I'm really excited to see that room. I'm so glad you said that because I'm really so, um, interested and kind of excited to see what that room does yeah. when the season starts because I think it's there's a lot of potential depth. in there. It, there's a ton of depth in there and a ton of guys that I'm looking forward to see. You know, DJ Jones, we've seen him a little bit last year, but we haven't seen him really play against elite competition. So it'll be fun to kind of see him. It'll, it'll be fun to see Chandler kind of go out there and do what he's done at Tennessee for the past few years. And then maybe even a guy like Caleb Hood or Josh Henderson who – um, you know, it would be Hood's first reps ever if he can come in and be maybe a, a um, you know, a red zone back or a goal line back or something like that. I think that would be good to see. And I loved your tweet about Hood yesterday, which I wanted to mention. You kind of said, I think he's going to be a fall forward guy at North Carolina. And I couldn't agree more with, with that analysis. Of him, so. was a fall forward guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was a, a couple quick uh, things about the running back room before we go on to the next group. Mm -hmm. Guy Chandler right now is probably reading the lyrics to the school fight song. Yeah, Max quote about that, that was funny yesterday. That. He's learning the school fight song, so he knows he's going to get used to when it's playing when they're out of town. Oh, yeah, that's a school fight song. Um, he doesn't know probably that any different uh, from that AHA song that they play. That Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. Every college band in America plays. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, um, two, this time two years ago, nobody looked at Michael Carter the way we look at him now. He had two years yeah. under his belt. And he, he showed flashes, but we never saw anything consistent. Part of it was the line wasn't that great. Part of it was the scheme and everything else. But you bring in a whole new everything, and suddenly Michael Carter's a star. And this time two years ago, we had a snapshot of Javante against Western Carolina and also against NC State. You wrote about him at that time as well. And nobody had any idea he was going to become what he became. So mm -hmm. the unknown factor is there with this room, but the talent, is there. I don't think it's that any different from a couple of years ago uh, because we didn't know what Javante would be. So it would not surprise me if a couple of these guys explode. If DJ Jones explodes this year and Chandler has a fantastic season and they post really, really impressive numbers, maybe not Javante Michael numbers from last year, but if you yeah. were to take that away from your consciousness, remove it from your consciousness, still outstanding numbers. I do think that that's very possible. Yeah. Completely agree, AJ. Let's move on to the offensive of Alon. Um, and we'll talk about the wide receivers after that. I think O line wise, you got all five of your starters back. You got some guys like William Barnes. Diego Pounds has looked good as a freshman this year. Some also some other guys behind them that you know Ed Montillas has been in the rotation for a long time with this O line. So I think depth wise, you've got just a ton of bodies on it down there. And obviously returning your 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 five starters is a big help, especially when you got a gunslinger and a you know potential Heisman guy and Sam Howell behind you. I think that's a, a recipe for success right there. So I mean, we kind of know who the starting group's gonna be. I think it's more interesting to see, okay, who steps in as a backup and can they maybe get to the 10 guy mark um depth wise. Okay, well, we know that the starters are going to be uh, Awesome Richards at left tackle. It's yep. going to be Z Josh Azuda at left guard, Brian Anderson mm -hmm. at the center, Marcus McKeith at right guard, and Jordan Tucker Jordan at right Tucker, tackle. Yeah. But, you know, Kieran Johnson's going to be in the mix at guard and center doing some stuff. Montillas can play. He's been starting all spring. He started 14 games in his career at, at, at guard. So mm -hmm. he's a guy that's, that's been there, done that guy. And then William Mar Barnes, his emergence, and we saw him play Saturday a lot at tackle, and he was mauling dudes at tackle. Yeah, he looked good. Yeah, yeah. And, and one play he blocked uh, Jaquarius Conley, which, trust me, as an offensive lineman, one of the hardest things to do is to be able to block those speed guys. And sometimes they get in situations where they don't have to pancake them, but they have to shade them enough so mm -hmm. the play can actually occur and they disrupt their route. He did a little bit more than shade Aquarius Conley on that. He showed some athletic ability, some quickness that he probably didn't have when he was 342 pounds that he now has at 316 pounds, which is what he yeah. told us last week that he's down to. So I think they're really solid with eight. So if they go to nine and 10, I think Jonathan Adorno's in that mix. 
Mm-hmm. Caden Baker, we talked about him yesterday. We were in the press box. He is look, starting to look the part. He, yeah. looks oh, more part. he looks more the part Saturday than he did in, in the first practice we were able to watch, which was practice yeah. number three. And I like Malik McGowan. He's another mm-hmm. guy that's had some really good moments this spring. And then, of course, I don't, I don't think Diego Pounds is going to play much this year. But mm-hmm. I think we could see a situation like, like Austin Richards where – he got a couple of snaps, like um, extra points and stuff as a freshman, and then stepped in and started the next year. Yeah. If Jordan Tucker goes, and depending on what, what they do um, with the rest of the line, I could see a guy like Diego Pounds contending for a starting spot in 22. He's a monster, and in the, the drills that we watch, boy, he's really good at times. He he beat some pretty good players on a couple of drills uh, last weekend when we were watching, and he had the quickness and the strength, and he had you know, good leverage and all that kind of stuff, so uh, he was impressive to watch. He's just going to get better and better. Offensive line's in really good shape. There are really good players we haven't even mentioned. But if you're talking about what might be a rotation, if it grows and grows and grows, we just went 12 deep. Mm-hmm. Trust me. You know, Coach Cap had some pretty good lines. They had a lot of bodies, but they had a lot of attrition during that time period as well. We never talked 12 deep with the offensive line. It was a struggle to get to seven. And Phil Longo told us a couple of weeks ago, if you can get to nine, that's elite. Mm-hmm. I think that they are on the cusp of being elite on the offensive line. Yeah, and I think the the main goal for them in the fall is probably going to be, you know, continuing to build that depth behind the starters and see how many guys they can they can get, you know, before the game in Blacksburg that they feel comfortable with rotating out. And obviously that'll change going in, you know, as the season goes on as well. You might find a few more guys that maybe you didn't expect to be as successful out there when they're put in that, that emerge and, and vice versa. So, yeah, I, I would agree. I think the O-line overall, we've talked about them before in, in the Tape Talk series we've done as well. And I think you're set down there with just the amount of depth and and when you got all your starters coming back, you got to be feeling pretty good about that. So last thing, AJ, we can, we can kind of, we'll tie the tight ends in with the wide receiver group, but um, I, I think. Tight end slash wide receiver. Yeah. Tight end, tight end, tight end. I like that. We'll go ahead and kind of put those together. I think Garrett Walston's probably the starter at tight end. No one's going to argue that obviously decided to come back for another season. Um, really impressed with what I've continued to see from him. Um, I was always impressed with him last season. And I, I think Sam said earlier in the spring that he wants to continue to target him and get him more looks. And they may be able to do that. It might not have to keep him back there pass blocking as much when you consider how talented the O-line is and how much depth they have down there. He might be able to have a little bit more freedom to step out and run some routes and, and be a legit option for how on a consistent basis. So you've got him. I'll let you dive into the depth in that. But let's talk about the wide receivers real quick before I kick it to you. Um, the top four receivers for me, if you will, uh, Bo Corrales, who has been kind of limited in spring practice a little bit, has kind of been in and out, uh, still recovering from that sports hernia surgery. Antoine Green, Josh Downs, and Emory Simmons. I think those are your top four guys. Um, going to be interesting to see how that starting rotation kind of plays out. I mean, Corrales is going to be in there somewhere. D- does he step in for Antoine Green? Does he step in for Emory Simmons as well? I think Josh Downs is definitely going to start. I mean, I think Matt called him the best receiver on the team earlier this spring. So, but those top four guys, we can dive into the depth a little bit as well. I think you're really set with who the starters are um, at both the tight end and wide receiver position. I think the main thing going into fall, kind of like I mentioned with the O-line and the running back room as well, is kind of figuring out who those guys behind them are and how the rotation ends up setting out. But overall, I think you're pretty set in both those positions. But, well, clearly Garrett's going to start a tight end. Uh, Kamara mm-hmm. Morales has looked pretty good when we yep. see him. Coppenhaver. Copenhaver has uh, really looked good when we He's seen impressed. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think that those are – they could go too deep there. Um, you know, Kendall Carr has battled some injuries and stuff like that. I don't really – I can't really tell you a whole lot about what we've seen from him, but I do think they can go three deep at tight end. And Garrett – Garrett's a pro. I think Garrett's mm-hmm. going to play in the NFL. Yeah, and so, you know, he could do a lot of things. Well, he's a good blocker. I do think that it would be good to target him more. Um, especially if they do have some issues in the running game, they could use that tight end a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, keep, make those linebackers cover, man. Make opposing linebackers yeah. cover. He's a big target. He's athletic. You know, he's with John Lilly, who is teaching him how to be an NFL guy. That is clearly his mission. His buddy is Jake Vargas. Vargas was a much less accomplished player at North Carolina, but played with the Vikings last year in sort of an H-back type role. Uh, and Vargas has told him, 
you know, here are the 53 things you need to do to be an NFL player. And I think Derek could check most of those boxes. So oh, yeah. he's going to be really, really good. Uh, I'm going to disagree a little bit about wide receiver. I actually think the starting lineup, the starting three wide receivers when they get to Blacksburg is going to be Josh Downs, Choffrey Brown, and Bo Corral. That's a good point. I did forget about Choffrey because he's been out with most of the spring. With, with Bo's a that, starter. That's a good point. Yeah. That's, Bo's that's a starter. Good point. Bo did some stuff. He's run drills. They just mm. didn't want to put him out there in scrimmage stuff. There's no point in – and, you know, potentially uh, exacerbating the, the injury he had last fall. Bo is a really good player. Bo is going to be in, a, in an NFL camp in a year from now. I would think I, so, yeah. I don't know mm-hmm. to what extent, and we'll see this next year. You, you know, it's not a super senior year for him because he would have redshirted last year anyhow because he played in four games. He's missed games in three of his four seasons, so he would be a natural fifth-year senior, and I think we have a chance to see him really take off. He's a, he, he has the flair for the dramatic, but sometimes he drops the passes that are right to him. If he can eliminate that problem, I think Bo, Bo Corrales will be in an NFL camp somewhere. Don't know if he'll make a team, but he'll have an opportunity to make a team. He's athletic, yeah, shot. Mm-hmm. he's strong, and he's, he's a tough dude, and uh, he runs pretty good routes, so he's a really, really good option. He has over 100 catches. Carolina. So he's a guy that that's played a lot of football in, in a group that's not super experienced. Choffrey's the fastest guy on the team. And Diami told us a couple of times Choffrey was faster than him. So if you have in your mind right now, Diami taking off the top of the defense, well, then replace that with number one. He can do it as well. But the question with him, can he run those crossing runs? You mm-hmm. know, can, can he do some of the other stuff? I believe he can. He didn't participate this spring, so he's kind of been off our radar. But I believe he can do those things. I think those three are going to be really good. And then when you're backing them up with Antoine Green and Emery Simmons, and and I think that they like what they, you know, Justin Olsen one of those guys that you like Obi Boone on defense. He keeps doing stuff to force yeah. the staff to have him at the tail end of the rotation. He made a really nice catch on that Drake Mayball. It was just out of bounds. I think they like what Stephen Gosnell can give them. And then mm-hmm. the freshman, I think JJ Jones has a chance to crack the rotation as well. In Take time, care. Kobe mm-hmm. Paysauer. Um, Gavin Blackwell, those guys are going to be in the mix too. Maybe not as much this year. I do think JJ Jones because he can be that other long fade receiver in the end zone, that other option there. And the fact that he can fly, I think that he may have a chance to get in the rotation too. They're deep at wide receiver and they actually, Sam may actually throw uh, to a lot more guys on a regular basis this year, which I think might collectively make the group better. Yeah. I, I think the potential is there by when we get to December say, wow, what a really good receiving core because you've got your possession guys, you've got your take the top of the defense off guys, you've got your dudes that can go to the corner of the end zone and catch tough balls, and you got guys that can come over the middle, you've got a couple of guys in each of those wide receiver slots that can run those different routes, and you've got a tight end who could be a, who's a part of that passing game. And you've got Ty Chandler who can be a receiver out of the backfield. And you've got DJ Jones who can be a receiver out of the backfield. I think that the passing game can be all over the field this year. Sam could have a lot more options to throw to, which means that that guy's going to post some really impressive numbers. How about that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I'm very, very high on the offense, as you guys know. And, and it's not – you know, when, when you go and you watch these guys up close – and you see them practicing, you know what the program has had before. And I have covered really good teams in the past. I covered a lot of the really good Clemson teams in the early Dabo years. And there's Virginia Tech teams that won ACC titles when I was at Fox. I know what a lot of these teams look like. And this club has it. They have it in every room on offense. It's just a matter of let's see what these guys can do. Roll it out there and let them play. And I think that there are some names of players that the average fan doesn't really know very well right now that they're going to love by the time Halloween ends. Yeah, the wide receiver room especially is just incredibly deep with talent. And that's something we talked about in our video Saturday is kind of the team as a whole, even on the defensive line as well. And kind of in the secondary, there's they got a ton of dudes. Now, there's a lot of potential in that group that in the wide receiver room, especially that hasn't maybe not proved it yet. But I think overall, when you've got so many talented guys in that room, I mentioned it yesterday during our video on Saturday, during our video as well, competition, you know, is a good thing. It usually breeds yeah. success. So. So, yeah, I, it, the offense as a whole, which you can kind of – there's one main takeaway from, from I think, this chat is just you got a lot of options, man. you got a lot of talent. There's still some guys that really need to prove that they're ready to play at this level that are a little bit younger. But, you know, overall, I think you got to be feeling pretty good about this offense if you're a Carolina fan and, you know, if you're Mac Brown or Phil Longo going into the, to the season. 
They averaged, I think, 41.7 points a game last year. I think they were eighth in the nation scoring. I don't know if they'll do that again. Yeah, I believe it's... that's the most in school history, but, but they may not have to. Mm-hmm. They may not have to do that again. I don't know. I think the defense is going to be better, but the offense is still going to be outstanding. And I think the, the, the running backs will be good enough where they can effectively use those RPOs. I think they have enough good receivers that there's a lot of options out there for, for Sam. And I think the offensive line with the combination of the tight end and the running backs and pass protection are going to be better. Sam's not going to get hit as much. I think the offense is good enough that Sam Howe can win a Heisman Trophy with this offense. Yeah, and I think – the biggest testament to 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 how good this offense is and how good the you know how this program and the direction they're going is the fact that you can you know you can lose Michael Carter, Javante Williams, Deami Brown, Daz Newsom over three thousand yards of offense, and we can still hop on this podcast right now and feel pretty good about the offense going into next season. So I think that's a real testament to the direction the program's headed in and what recruiting's been able to do. And, you know, when you got a guy like Sam Howell back there, I think that helps out a little bit too. So yeah, I think, I think it's a good place to wrap this one up, AJ. Um, like I said, guys, the first episode of our two part fall look ahead series, we're doing the defense as well. So make sure you guys stay tuned for that. But, as we mentioned in the beginning of the video, make sure you guys head over to TarHillIllustrated.com. Just click the description below. You'll see a link in there and sign up to our premium boards for just eight thirty three a month. It's a great time to do it with the offseason coming up because there's just going to be a ton of football and basketball recruiting stuff in particular going on, not to mention all the other offseason content and podcasts and everything else will be rolling out. So make sure you guys head on over there and sign up. I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. You guys know the drill. Like, share, subscribe to our channel. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.